All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Well, today I'm in my 2018-2019 Land Rover Range Rover P525 5-litre supercharged V8 autobiography, which is probably the longest model name in the whole of the automotive industry, and I've just reached an important milestone. I bought this car about a year ago with 14,000 miles on the clock, and I've just hit 24,000 miles. So any budding Carol Vordermans out there will be able to work out that I've done 10,000 miles. Quick maths. So today I thought I'd talk you through my 10k experience. How many times it's left me stranded, how bad it is on fuel, how good the cappuccino is at the local Land Rover main dealer, all that sort of stuff. As you all know, Range Rovers have a horrendous name for being unreliable vehicles, and that theory is perpetuated generally by people who have never owned one, or driven one. You've all heard it before, you know how it goes, you don't need me to tell you. Well, my mate's brother had one and it was always in the garage broken. Or, you know, my buddy had one of those, he spent more time in the shop than in his garage. Okay, yes, we've heard it all before. Honestly, if I had a penny for every one of those stories I'd heard, I'd be able to buy, well, another Range Rover. It's boring and frankly unimaginative, so if you are one of those people, please think of something else to say. Please. In reality, this has been no less reliable than anything else I've ever owned. My two previous L405s were exactly the same. Yes, there have been a couple of hiccups along the way, but that's to be expected with any complicated luxury car. I've never, ever had an L405 leave me stranded. Touch wood. The thing you've got to realise is the more complicated a car is, you've got a greater chance of things breaking. It's as simple as that. It's basic stuff really, isn't it? The more moving parts you've got, the more there is to go wrong. That's why something like an iGo is very reliable, because it has nothing. Like anything in life, it's a trade-off, and I'm quite happy to go along with that in exchange for being able to drive this every day, which, in my opinion, without sounding sycophantic, is the best car in the world. It just is. Sure, some cars are faster, some cars are more luxurious, some cars are even better off-road, but there isn't a single other car that does it all quite so well as the full-size Range Rover. Fact. That isn't open for debate either, that is fact. I mean, it's comfortable, beyond compare. You could even press this little button here and get a massage while you drive along. In addition to that, it's fast. Seriously fast. You forget just how fast this car is. It's way faster than a car of this size ought to be. Watch this. Listen to that supercharger spoil up. That's... That's... It's ridiculous, is what it is. Ridiculous. Five hundred and twenty-five horsepower. It's more horsepower than you get from my blue AMG Mercedes. Ridiculous. And all of a sudden I'm back down to 38 miles an hour again, and it is as quiet as a sleeping kitten. It's also very practical, very luxurious, and very clever. Like I said, no car does it quite as well as the full-size Range Rover, especially the one with a 5-litre supercharged V8 under the bonnet. Something else. Also, while I'm singing this car's praises, the headlamps are the best headlamps I've used on any vehicle ever. And to top it all off, I know this is subjective, some might disagree, but I think it looks superb. The Range Rover Sport is a little bit chavvy, but the full-size Range Rover just looks class wherever you go. Whether you're out here in the countryside or in the city centre, it just looks right. Anyway, that's all the positives. Now on to the negatives. I bet some of you can't wait for this. Since I've had it, it has had to go back to Land Rover a couple of times. Don't laugh. I'll explain why. But first, I just want to say a quick thank you to today's video sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark. Surfshark are a long-time supporter of the channel, so by checking them out, you are helping support the channel, so I do appreciate it. If you haven't heard of them before, they're a VPN service provider, so they help to keep you safe while you're online, whether that's doing online shopping or online banking. It protects you so that all your data and your details are safe, and it hides your IP address so cyber thieves can't view it. It's also handy if you watch lots of streaming sites such as Netflix. Now, this is what I mainly use Surfshark for, to be honest. You know how sometimes you'll try and find your favourite TV show or movie and it isn't available in your region? Well, with Surfshark, you can change your location settings so that it thinks you're in a different country. Then all of a sudden, hey presto, it becomes available. I spend quite a bit of time in Spain, so I mainly use it when I'm there so that it thinks I'm still in the UK so I can watch all my favourite TV shows from back home. In addition to that, it blocks malware, phishing, ads and other kinds of nastiness, which in turn can spin at your bandwidth and make your device run much more quickly. You can download the app very easily from the App Store and you can use it on an unlimited number of devices. It's cheap and easy to use. We're all online a huge amount of time these days, you just don't know how much information you're putting out there, so it's better to stay protected. Especially if you frequently use public Wi-Fi spots such as at airport terminals, train stations, fast food restaurants, that sort of thing. My life's stressful enough as it is without getting my bank account hacked into or my credit card details stolen. And since I've been using Surfshark, touch wood, that just hasn't happened. 
If you click the link below, which is surfshark.deals forward slash hypecortos and use the promo code hypecortos, you'll get 83% off and an extra three months totally free. And we're talking a couple of quid a month there, so don't think it's some big expensive commitment because it really isn't. So if you do online banking, online shopping, or you just want to watch your favorite TV shows from another country, check out Surfshark. Right, back to my Range Rover. Like I said, since I've had it in those 10,000 miles, it's been to Land Rover three times. Before you start saying, I told you so, Matt, you should have bought a Land Cruiser, it has only been minor things. It's never left me stranded. I've recently had a few meetings in our capital city, which is a 400 mile round trip, and I've jumped in this without a moment's hesitation. Its first visit to Land Rover was because of an engine light. Now that's fairly common stuff these days, unfortunately. Cars are more and more complicated and there are sensors everywhere. So it doesn't take much for something to go wrong and it to ping on a light. It just isn't a surprise anymore. In fact, I'm more surprised when I get in a car and there isn't an engine light on. Because I bought this from a Land Rover main dealer, Land Rover of North London or wherever it was, it came with an unlimited mileage Land Rover warranty. Most other warranties aren't worth the paper they're written on, but the genuine Land Rover one is. I called them up and they advised me to book it in with my local Land Rover main dealer, which is Land Rover Nutsford, so I did just that. It turned out to be a simple O2 sensor. In fact, they called me up to say, right Mr Goodwin, we've identified the problem, it is a upstream O2 sensor bank one. So I said, uh, right, okay, yeah, like I knew what that meant. What's an upstream O2 sensor? I know what an O2 sensor is, but upstream? You wanna see? I picked it up the very next day and it was all covered under warranty, but I'm told had it not been covered under warranty, it would have cost me £250. So not the end of the world, is it? Then about four months later, the engine light came back on. Again, no symptoms, it was all running fine, but the engine light was there. So I called up Land Rover Nutsford again, dropped it off with them, and again, it was an O2 sensor. This time it was a, I don't think it was a downstream, I think it was another upstream O2 sensor, but for bank three or bank four. So they sorted that out for me under warranty, and again, it would have been 250 pounds had I not had the warranty in place. I'm not defending them now because it is quite annoying. I haven't really got time to take two hours out of my day to go and drop it off at Land Rover Nutsford. But this is just cars for you, especially modern cars. They're overly complicated. And because I'm a car geek, I really don't mind wandering around the Land Rover showroom. The cappuccino is very good as well. Then the next issue happened in about November time last year. It was the first time we'd had particularly cold weather. I think it dropped to about minus six overnight. So everything was all frozen the next morning. When I got in the car the next morning, my driver's door just wouldn't close. It just kept bouncing open. So I assumed it was because of the frost. I assumed something had just frozen over. So I sat in it for about 20 minutes or so, getting it nice and warm, and it still wouldn't close. I went to the shed and got some WD-40 and sprayed the lock mechanism, all that sort of stuff, but still nothing. What's weird, you could hear the soft close motor trying to, trying to pull the door in. I'm guessing it's a cable system, a bit like your window regulator, and you could hear the cables kind of, kind of grabbing, kind of snatching. Didn't sound healthy at all. It just meant I was kind of stuck there. I couldn't close the car, I couldn't even lock the car, so I was just stuck on my driveway. Now, as part of the Land Rover warranty, you get Land Rover assistance breakdown. So I called them, about an hour later, a guy came out in a transit van and had a look at it for me. Now, annoyingly, by the time he got there, it started working, so it was just a false alarm. He said that it was probably due to the cold weather and sent me on my way. And that was it for another month or six weeks. Then it happened again. So I called them back out, they came back out, and thankfully this time, by the time they came, it was still faulty. He diagnosed it as a faulty soft close motor. So he took the door card off, disconnected the soft close motor, and that meant that I could slam the door shut and lock the car. He was a really helpful guy actually, and obviously he didn't keep a soft close motor on his van. So he ordered one for me, which was to be delivered at Land Rover Nutsford. So two or three days later, I dropped it off at Land Rover Nutsford and they fitted it for me, free of charge all covered by the Land Rover extended warranty. Now I agree with you, on a four or five year old car that cost £100,000 when it was new, that sort of thing shouldn't fail. But, like I said at the start, the more things you have, the more things there are to go wrong. And in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't that important, it didn't leave me stranded. If that's all you've got to worry about these days, the soft close motor not working on your Range Rover, then your life's not bad. And that's been it for things breaking. Now in terms of other expenditure, it was due its MOT in February, so I had that done and it needed two front tyres, they were wearing a little bit low. I asked my mechanic to order me two matching Continental Cross contacts, so they matched the back, and they were quite expensive, but then they go into me, the 21 inch wheels, and it's quite a heavy, big car. Those two tyres cost me £384 plus VAT for the pair, and the MOT was £40. I also had it serviced towards the end of last year. I think it was back in December I got in it one morning and it flashed up to say it was due a service. So I called Land Rover Nutsford and booked it in. That was £590, but that was for a full service and it included, I think it was like a 60,000 mile service, even though it had only done 22. Interestingly, that included a transfer box service, which is due at 60,000 miles or five years. And I was quite pleased to have that done. 
I just noticed in the months leading up to that, every time you did a three-point turn or a five-point turn, you could feel the back end kind of slightly snatching. And since I replaced the fluid in the transfer box, that's gone. As I always preach, prevention is better than the cure. Another cost you've got here in the UK is the road tax. Now, on this particular car here in the UK, that cost me £520 a year. But weirdly, as soon as the car reaches five years old, that figure drops down to £165 a year. Which I actually don't think is very fair, but for once in my life, it actually falls in my favour, so I shall keep my mouth firmly shut. The biggest cost really is the fuel. Now, that probably won't come as much of a surprise. It's a big, heavy car with a 5-litre supercharged V8 petrol engine. If I'm gentle with it, it'll do about 20 miles per gallon, which I actually don't think is too bad. On a long, steady run, it'll do high 20s, and if I'm a bit careless, around town, it'll do high teens. But here's a bit of man maths for you. This always makes me feel a bit better. Petrol's substantially cheaper than diesel. There are no turbos to brake. The injectors aren't as sensitive as diesel injectors. There's no DPF to clog up, and you don't have to touch the gross, greasy diesel pump at the petrol station. So I'm still convinced petrol's the way to go. Let me work out the cost roughly then. This is a rough estimate. So I've done 10,000 miles. Let's say I've done 20 miles per gallon. 10,000 miles divided by 20 miles per gallon. So I've used 500 gallons of fuel. It's quite a lot, isn't it? There's roughly 4.5 litres in an imperial gallon. So uh, 5 times 500 is 2,500 less half. Two. So I've used 2,250 litres of fuel. Let's say petrol costs £1.50 a litre, so 2,250 litres times £1.50, that is 3,375 Great British Pounds in petrol. It's quite a high figure that, isn't it? Let's move on, I don't want to dwell on that too much. Although having said that, if I had a diesel Golf that did 40 miles per gallon, that figure would only be halved. In fact, it wouldn't even be halved because petrol, because diesel's more expensive than petrol. That's interesting, isn't it? So I could save... 12 or 1300 pounds a year in fuel if I drove a diesel Golf. Not much of a saving, is there? Well, saying that, it's not enough of a saving for me to want to get behind the wheel of a diesel Golf, let me put it that way. Let's do a running total then. So we've got 3375 on fuel, 590 on a service, 520 on tax, 460 on tyres, 40 on an MOT. That makes my grand total for 10,000 miles in the best car on the road at £4,985. So, well, just, just shy of 50p a mile, isn't it? I don't know whether that's good or not. There'll be some people who tell me that that's all right, and then there'll be other people out there who'll balk at that figure. Who knows? There is one more thing to take into account, and that's depreciation. Now, unusually, we're still living in strange times, so it hasn't really depreciated, even with 10,000 more miles on the clock. But I'm not daft enough to think that that will continue forever because I know it won't. But for now, it hasn't really depreciated. I think I could still retail this for my money back. So I think that's about it. 10,000 miles in my supercharged Range Rover has cost me just shy of £5,000. We'll see if next year is any more expensive. Or cheaper. Could be cheaper. Thinking about it, I'm not sure how it could be cheaper. Anyway, we'll worry about that next year. Right, thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll leave the link below. If you've got any comments or questions, let me know below and I'll do my best to get back to you. So yeah, cheers guys. See you next time.